Thank you very much. Oh, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to say it properly. I'm sorry. That the Finance Advisory Committee approved the agenda for the March 3rd, 2023 meeting. So I'll do that. I'll do it better. <laughs> better job on that uh, stuff. <laughs> so um, adoption minutes, uh, draft minutes were provided in the package uh, from our meeting um, held February 23rd. And um, if I could first have a, a mover and seconder for those minutes. I would move it. I'll move. John and Judy, thank you. Uh, any questions, comments, or proposed uh, amendments to those minutes? Seeing none. Um, recommendation is that the minutes of the Finance Advisory Committee held meeting held February 23rd be adopted. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We'll move on. Um, any public comments, Steph? Nope. Thank you. We'll now move on. We're now moving to four, uh, page two of the agenda, 4.1. And Kristen will be presenting on the 2023 to 2027 five year financial plan, including the draft budget material. We've allocated a very significant amount of time for discussion for the committee. Appreciate that. And um, <clears throat> Kristen, I will uh, turn it over to you, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I am going to share my screen with you. I have a, a presentation for you um, sure. here that I think provides a lot of context and additional background information that um, may help to provide um, a lot of additional understanding of the numbers that have been presented in the material. Okay, thank you. So let's see. There's been an upgrade to Zoom and a couple things have changed. Um, okay, so I'm hoping that you have my screen right now, which has a PowerPoint slide. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's got the you... little slides down the left side. Can you? I can, yeah. I just. Um... And. There we go. Okay. And Kristen, you can also go to full screen to get rid of all that stuff at the top. Do you have? Um, no, it's not going to switch up. It's oh. not, okay. Um, I need to, I'll, I'll try sharing the other screen that it went on to, just, sorry, one moment. No problem. Just getting used to running presentations again. Yeah, it's good. Oh. And you should have the entire yes. Yes. success. Thank you for your patience. Okay. <laughs> so welcome to the um the first run through of the 2023 to 2027 draft budget. Uh, we're meeting today with the finance advisory committee. Um here we go. So I wanted to take a few moments to just sort of uh, walk through some of the underlying assumptions that uh, have been built in and, and underline all of the numbers in the budget. So first of all, we are, um, we are proposing that uh, we think it's likely that inflationary pressures are going to stick around for a little bit. They're, they're here to stay for a bit. So we have included a provision for salaries and benefits at 4% for year one, and all of the remaining operations expenses have been inflated by 3% for each of the ensuing um, four years, 2024 through 2027. Um, of course, with increased inflation, we think that interest rates are going to remain um, quite high. So we believe that they will probably fall somewhere between three and 4% for at least the first couple of years of the planning period. Currently our debt um, is locked in, 7 million of it is locked in at four and 2.2% of it is locked in at 2%. So we don't have interest rate risk on, um, on those uh, significant sums of debt. We have a couple of loans that are outstanding. Um, 655,000 is a floating loan for Tunstall Bay. We're keeping that um, in floating for the time being. 
And as well, we have a short-term equipment loan through the MFA. The balance on that at December 31st is 560,000, and that's also a floating loan. So there's a little bit of interest rate risk there, but the amounts are overall are not um, too significant. Mm -hmm. um, underlying the uh, financial plan, we have an assumption around population growth. And if we go back to the prior census, um, Bowen experienced unprecedented growth from 2016 to 2021 of 15.7 related to the pandemic and, and people moving to smaller remote communities. So within the budget, the level of population growth is a, it's assumed that we're not going to go over this rate within the um, next four years. And the reason that we have to consider this is because this has implications for us for the funding of police services within the municipality. And we will... Um, We'll touch more on that a little bit later. But if we did, uh, you know, according to the chart here, if we were to um, continue to experience annual growth um, at that, that rate, 15.7, we would be just about under 5,000 population uh, in the year 2026, which is when the next census will take place. And that is what's really, um, really critical, what our population is in 2026. Uh, our development revenue projections, we do believe that we're going to um, experience a drop in this year in development revenue. Uh, we believe that uh, new building permits are going to slow down a little bit. Uh, people may be holding off on renovations and, and that kind of thing. So we are providing for a drop of about 15% in um, development revenue for the 2023 planning year. Uh, perhaps that could extend into 2024 and then start to see a gradual pickup again in the last three years of the plan. Uh, a significant piece of this budget relates to the community center and the funding for that. Um, we have built into this budget a very an ambitious uh, expectation that the grant application for the Community Center Cultural Spaces grant for 732,000, that we're gonna be successful on that grant. And we also have built into the budget that the fundraising campaign um, will be successful. And we, are, we have um, put into the budget uh, $936,000 of fundraising donations still to be, um, still to be raised. Those are the assumptions built into the budget. And in the uh, budget material that I sent out, I did do um, a, a page for you, which has um, kind of a contingency plan. You know, we need to, we have to set our budget based on one expectation, but if we don't believe that, if we, if we aren't successful with that expectation, we have to have a plan B. So in the budget material there, there is some information on what a particular plan B could look like for Bowen Island. Um, within the budget, we have assumed that the community center will be opening its doors to the public in October of 2023, and that we will be uh, in receipt of incremental revenue from rental of the community center spaces to outside groups. And in the budget, there has been um, put in $10,000 of incremental revenue for 2023. 70,000 for 2024 and 100,000 plus 3% um, growth for each of 25 through 2027. The um, financial plan assumes that there will be additional staffing required to operate the community center. So the, um, the plan does uh, include uh, a 1.0 FTE facility manager position and a 1.75 FTE uh, staffing provision for custodial staffing. We need to make sure that that building is open to the public and, and that there's staff on site um, in the early mornings and late into the evening when it closes at night. So those, um, those 1 point and 1.75 FTE have been adjusted for 2023 based on the assumption of that, um, that later start during the year. We are assuming that that facility manager will be required um, earlier than October. So we've put him in or her in 
um, as of July 1st, because that role will um, likely be needed to help open the building. There'll be commissioning of, 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 of systems, of HVAC systems, and all kinds of new things that relate to the startup of a sophisticated building like that. So we believe that we're going to need some expertise and some assistance in that role. So we have um, anticipated a July 1st start for that role. As well, custodial staffing can um, really not be put in place until quite close to the opening date. So we've, um, we've estimated an, an October 1st start there with custodial staffing. Um, some changes to the FTE complement. Overall, we haven't added any additional FTE, but we have reallocated half an FTE from the manager of bylaw position that that position was not replaced. And we've reallocated that to um, provide additional support in the HR coordinator role from a 0.5 to a 1.0. And um, just looking at the very fundamental uh, requirements of a municipal budget has to balance. And when we think of a budget, we think of all our different sources of revenue. But in the municipal context, really what we're doing is balancing all of our cash inputs with all of our cash outflows. So we look at things like debt proceeds and we call them revenues. They're not really revenues, but they're sources of cash. And those, um, all of those uses of cash in, 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 in that municipal budget, they all must have um, an offsetting source of cash. So that's why we, we consider things like debt proceeds as a revenue. And in this year's um, 2023 budget, under that revenue line item, you'll see a number, I think it's $2.1 million of debt proceeds. It's not new debt, it's unexpended debt proceeds from the borrowing that we did last year. We just haven't quite used them. We've had them that were hung on to them in the bank account. We've invested them and they're earning interest for us at 5%. Um, and we will be accessing those funds as the community center project progresses. And we'll be using that to uh, fund the, the project as it goes along. So in order to make that source of cash equal our use of cash and balance our budget, we need to include it again this year as a, a new revenue. So our property tax revenue requirement is um, estimated at 13.3% for next year. Uh, in year 2024, we believe we're looking at about 5.8%, um, um, and that drops down to 3.4% for 2025. In 2026, um, we'll, we believe that there'll be um, a bump up again, six point, up to 6.8%. That's um, it's actually a result of the uh, additional planned or proposed borrowing uh, with regards to that workshare project. And then out to year five, um, we believe that um, another 3.5% will be. <clears throat> Looking at the revenues, um, 2023 revenue, the obvious, the first uh, property, property tax revenue is um, increasing from a budget of 6.5 million in 2022 to 7.4 million in 2023. Um, the parcel tax revenue is strictly focused at funding um, uh, the solid waste service. So it's not anticipated to change. That is a fixed contract and it's fixed until the, um, the uh, 2028, I believe. So we will be looking at renegotiating that in, in the outer years. But for the period of this budget, uh, the only change to that solid waste contract would be the annual amounts paid to Metro Vancouver for tipping fees. So it's been increased very uh, slightly just to reflect uh, an, an increase in annual tipping fees. Um, our sales of services, they, uh, they include things like our, um, our recreation fees and um, the new, um, sorry, Mostly recreation fees, moorage, um, uh, snuck coke dock rentals, that kind of thing. Um, I have to have a look at it just to, to see what we put in there to make it increase, increase. Um, over the over this year. Um, 
The grant revenue is 8.4 million. There's quite a few different grants in there. We've got the balance of the community center fund grant that has not been expended yet. Um, we've got um, some potential grant funding or some approved grant funding that we've received for the compost facility, which has been um, put back into the budget for consideration this year. We have, um, of course, the anticipated grant for 732,000 from the Canada Cultural Spaces Program. And a new grant um, that we are, at, we're actually waiting for the province to finalize and make an announcement upon. Um, we've uh, notionally put it in as $500,000. It's called the Growing Communities Fund. And we are um, awaiting an announcement imminently from the provincial government as to how much that grant will ultimately be. It is to be used for infrastructure needs or for community amenities that are required in our, in our communities that are growing by population and leaps and bounds and trying to get their infrastructure to keep up. So for the purposes of this budget, the assumption has just been that, um, that we'll, we'll take the funds and we'll put it in a reserve once I mean, there's so many balls in the air with regards to the community center, there's so many unknowns as to what the fundraising campaign will ultimately yield. There's an unknown around that $732,000 grant that I believe that it's prudent for council to just hang on to those funds until such time as the outcome of the community center fundraising campaign and grant application is known. Um, I believe it is important to take any additional unexpected funds and help to deal with that funding gap that we have on that um, on that capital project. Uh, because without, without closing that gap before December 31st of 2023, um, we're going to be looking at either additional borrowing or raising taxes in order to find the funds to finish that project. So my recommendation to council will be just to um, sit on that money until we have a better picture of of what the what the what it looks like for our community center program. Kristen, yeah. may I jump in here for a minute? Uh, mm -hmm. Because this would seem to be as good a time as any to announce it, but I received a call from the um, minister yesterday and the news on the uh, community fund grant was just uh, lifted from embargo a couple of hours ago. Bowen okay. will be receiving... Uh, $2.287 million yep. uh, from that fund. So that is more than four times what we have in our budget, which is fantastic news. Um, I will uh, revise the reports that go to council for uh, to be posted on Monday and um, ensure that there is a, a fulsome report and recommendation, which we can um, discuss here after at the end of the presentation and get some input from finance committee about how to best allocate that amazing sum of money. <laughs> yes, I, I, did, I didn't want to uh, throw a curveball at you and it was just, it was the news is so recent. So the embargo yeah. on that news was I know. literally just lifted. So I know uh, that's such good news, Mayor. Question. So is there going to be more discussion about that later? I, I think it would, um, yeah, I think that definitely okay, a recommendation you. from FAC Good. as to the proper allocation or, you know, Good. best allocation of those funds would yeah. help. And my, my intention here in terms of our presentation is to allow Kristen to proceed through our presentation. I wasn't sure if you want to have, I was sort of leaving questions to come back to and maybe review it by section, but rather than sort of jump in as you go along. So I do have various questions, but I would like you to sort of proceed uh, Good. Yep. and allow that part of the presentation to complete it, and then it, open it up for, this, for questions. It may um it may work to stop after revenue and have a conversation if there were any rel you know prudent questions. Sometimes you kind of lose the urgency of them if you wait till the end. Well, I've got them all written down. It's okay. 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 <laughs> the donation revenue figure two point one million that is um, that includes the. Uh, proposed fundraising campaign of 936, as well as confirmed donations of just over uh, 900,000 that um, 
is being held by Bowen Island Community Foundation and 165,000 of donations that we have uh, here at the municipality. So that's, um, that's what's sitting in that 2 million there. The development revenue, as indicated earlier, we believe will drop. And other income includes our um, interest revenue. It includes our new licensing fees from the use of the fire hall with BC Hydro, uh, as well as some other miscellaneous things in there. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the proceeds of debt, it's not any new debt, not new borrowing. It's just unexpended proceeds of the borrowing that was done last year. So mm -hmm. I'll stop there and, and allow for questions or continue at your direction. Sure. Any questions at this point? Yes. Judith? I'm sorry, Judy. So, um, sorry, the um, estimate that you had for the um, the building better communities or whatever, um, the new um, 2.287 mm -hmm. that Andrew just mentioned, where does that fit into these numbers? Into these numbers, it's sitting as a grant revenue as 500,000. We knew from an announcement from um, mm -hmm. Premier EB that the minimum amount that any community would receive is 500,000. I, I I did expect it to be um, more than that, but I like to play the conservative role whenever and hope that turn, things turn out better. <laughs> so 500,000 is included in the number 8474794. And then those funds are transferred out and deposited into one of the um, uh, statutory or non-statutory reserve funds that is shown on one of your documents and it's called the Growing Communities Fund. So it's just tucked right into that um, reserve fund and just being held pending additional information or, or recommendations from. But then the that line item, now that we're dealing with the different number, should be something like nine, seven, something Add like that? Add 1.7 to yeah, it. Yeah, it's gonna go up by 1.7, correct. Thanks. Okay, John, and then Allison. Thank you, Fred. Um, I'm quite uneasy with including <clears throat> donation revenue when we really have no idea we, if we can collect that money. Right? We, you know, everything else in here is really backed by a lot of very thorough mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And this one very large line item is just backed by air. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really think we should spend some time thinking about that one. I mean, I hate to take Mr. E. <clears throat> and use it to offset this one because I think his hope was we he we would use this money to reduce annual tax increases. But on the other hand, uh, you know, two point one million is a big number to just not have any firm commitment to receiving the money, and especially since the completion of the community center is is certainly going to occur by the end of this year and uh, we need that money thank you um just to clarify uh as i understand the donation revenue that's identified to 2.1 has has monies that that in fact are committed to it do they not uh a portion of it which is the the 932 the 932,000 whatever it is yes that is uh the balance are, are grants are are is there anything else in there that's that's un, that unassured? Because there was money raised that's being held. Yes. There's pledges. Okay, pledges, yeah. There is a confirmed donation cash proceeds, not a pledge, there's cash at the Bowen Island Community Foundation for just over 900,000 plus uh, a few pledges for I believe 55,000. But uh, there is a cash donation being held for 930,000. I, I, okay. So just nice. as a as a comment to, to what John was saying, there is a portion that's in hand, basically, right. mm -hmm. and available. I just wanted yeah. to confirm that that I understood that. Yes, um, nine hundred thirty-six is the um, unconfirmed amount. Thank you. Okay. Well, okay. Allison? So I thought there was a bunch. There, there were pledges, and so are you telling me the community all the pledged money has been paid to the community foundation? No, uh, I'm saying there is one significant donation that has been um, made and is sitting at the Community Foundation for just over 900000 Okay, and then how much is, uh, how, uh, how many, but there was still a whole bunch of pledges, 
I mean, I can tell you, I can think of two or three people that have pledged money, but aren't going to, haven't paid it yet. Uh, I believe the pledges that are also there are about 55,000. Okay. And then. Um, <clears throat> and I have 165,000. Okay. All right. Staff, I have no idea how to solve your problem. I've got my video on and. So I don't know whether it's bandwidth here or where I am or what. So you've got me the you. way you've got me. Um, and we can see you, Allison. Oh, okay. Because Steph just said I was a black screen. You I had stopped my video. You're, you're back. Yeah. Though. Okay. And then, um, okay. So I guess, um, where's my question I had about? Yeah. Okay. I'm okay. I don't have any questions with respect to. Well, I do with revenue, actually. The development revenue, you said this year, 2023, was less than 2022, which makes sense. And you're anticipating it's going to drop even further for 2024? Well, there's going to be a little bit of a lag between um, when the economy starts to... Um, yeah, no, that's fine. I just, it was a conscious lag, not a typo yeah. is what I was getting at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, All yeah. right. And, we've, and in the grant revenue... Um, I mean, we've got that outstanding grant request yet it's still out there for Eagle Cliff that we haven't had confirmed. So um, is that in the 8.4? No, this is only general fund. We are taking right, the, right, right. Water system. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Andrew, mm -hmm. you're on. You're on mute. The nature of 2023 is still on mute. The um, uh, question I have is just coming back to the revenue around the community center. So that 936,000, if I understand it, is unconfirmed, unpledged, and is the gap that we need to close. Yes. Like anticipatory donations, okay. Yes. Um, and the second question I have in the property tax revenue, does this contemplate the loss of the Cape Roger Curtis lands in that revenue being, um, if the rezoning goes to park? No, um, we, we actually, aren't we aren't going to budget for that it's not going to be an expense to the municipality a revenue requirement re remains the same what happens in the um event that lots are uh converted to non-taxable is that same revenue requirement exists however now everybody else in the community is just going to pay a little bit more to make up for that difference right yeah great thank you for that clarification is there any sense of what that dollar might be as it, as it relates to the values of those properties? I'm getting off track here, but I don't, I don't want to go. Yeah. Into that. I just want to know if it's a material amount or not. It, it 104,000. Pardon me? Yeah, it's 100,000 just on the raw land on the value okay. of the law. That's good enough. Thank you. Yeah. Any uh, other immediate questions here? I do have one as it relates to the property tax, but 13.3%. <laughs> Obviously, that's um what's the impact to homeowners uh or to to taxpayers because in the in the last year we've also had new development we've had a lot of things happen that have increased the base mm -hmm. overall mm -hmm. so while the dollars are 13.3 percent i guess the question is is there an estimate of what the percentage tax increase as it relates to this presentation would be for um individual taxpayers um, I'm going to make an estimate of about 10%. Okay. And the reason of that is there are um, there are always going to be additional revenues coming from growth uh, in the role yeah. itself. So new properties and that and that kind of um, thing, because if you're collecting the same amount of dollar for dollar over a bigger group of parcels, everybody in that parcel is going to end up paying a little bit less. That, of course, is going to be if that um, if we end up losing those lots out of the taxable assessment role and they become park, it'll be offset by that. So there's still a lot of things at play mm -hmm. as to what what the um, the impact to uh, a homeowner is, and I'm going to do um, more work on that as I as we get mm -hmm. the final role and as they um, confirm what the non-market change was for for last year. 
So yeah, there's still some more information coming. Um, what the actual effective tax rate will be, this 13.3% is strictly uh, a value of the additional dollars needed year to year. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go to Liam first and then Allison, because Liam just joined us. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and just adding on to uh, what Kristen just said, you know, the impact depends on also your own, each individual assessed value. So if your assessed value is going up or down or remaining yeah. the same, um, so uh, that that will also impact your, the actual percentage increase for the individual homeowner. Yeah, I was just thinking on average because that tend, tends to be how we would report it and how it might be received within the community when when those numbers are known. Yeah, typically we'll have as as the uh, we get feedback from this committee and and further develop the materials for the public. We'll have a representative household. Um, okay, thank you, Allison. It's a timing issue question. I mean, at this point, though, the CRC lots are owned by you know, they're, they're a taxable value. So if by March 31st, doesn't, isn't that sort of when BC assessment cuts everything off and any changes after that to ownership or whatever wouldn't have any impact until the next taxation year? Yeah, I had a conversation with them just to confirm my understanding of that. It's actually um, as at October 31st. So La okay, last year, yeah, yeah. So they need to do that, I think, to make sure that there's stability in the role for yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's if there would be no impact on them on those lots at CRC becoming park until the 2024. That's my understanding. Um, tax yeah. year, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Thanks. Okay, John. I I presume we're going to go through all the detailed various schedules, but I. I do know on the schedule where it shows the tax forgiveness, it shows the assessed values of the uh, lots that are owned by the Bowen Conservancy as 205,000 and the adjacent lot, which is still owned by private interest at 3.7 million. So that's gonna give you an indication of the drop in assessed value. And then also, of course, the 3.7 million uh, is taxed at the residential rate whereas the 205,000 is taxed at the park rate. So we, we don't have a park rate. Okay, so it would stay at the residential rate? Um, the lots, once they're removed out from the roll, once they lose their taxable um, taxable assessment, they, are, they, will, they will have zero basis for, for taxation. All of those lots initially had residential status. And also yeah. remember that we on Bowen have a one-to-one -one, um, ratio of business to residential. The only right. class is um, light industrial properties that have anything kind of more significant, so. Okay, because we, we certainly have the option of leaving the zoning as RR1 and just adding as a conditional uh, reduced <laughs> park. No, no Metro Vancouver is a non-taxable entity. Yeah, they, so. Anything they own that they use in their oh, okay. of delivering they, park they, services yeah. exempt by legislation. Yeah, we may want to save those discussions to another uh, meeting as it relates to uh, that particular topic. Um, anything further, John, or were you just your hands up? Yeah. Still? Yes. Can uh, I just ask? Sorry. Sorry, there was something else, but that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Can I just ask a, a question? I have one thing as it relates to development revenue um, decreasing. We're looking at a basically about a 23% decrease um, year over year from 2022 to 2023 and, and a reduced amount over the next three to four years generally. Um, I guess my question is uh, in looking at how that, depart how that operates, I know that um, they're looking for a, I think the overall salary benefit increase is around 9%. Uh, and um, I also, um, so I have to pull my comment up here. I'll never find it when I need it. Um, is that um, obviously there, is that consistent? I guess my question with the expectation of growth in population over the next couple of years, because there's only limited housing uh, in place for, for new residents to the island. So in fact, if we're gonna grow based on the numbers that were projected up into the 
for the next three or four years, is that development revenue projection and or the expenses associated with with planning and development, uh, is there, are those positions consistent? Uh, no, I think together the manager of planning and I would need to work together and, and do um, a more deep dive on that and, and really, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, 23% to me is-, is I thought know, it's only 15 pretty, on my calculation. Oh, I just looked at it, um, what did I say? Um, I, based on actual, right? Oh, on actual, yeah. I mean, oh, I, okay. I, I, okay. I was looking side, at budget. From the business side, Allison, I don't look at uh, budget to budget. I look at actual to budget. Yeah. Yeah. That's my that's my my background. And, uh, <laughs> no, I usually do that too. I just was comparing the. Yeah, it is twenty three percent, but you're also looking at an inc uh, above the four percent increase as it relates to staffing and and those costs in the department. And or what we're really expecting to happen on island over the course of the next three or four years. I mean, if they're occupied doing non-revenue generating special projects, I think there maybe should be an alternate source to that of funding to that department. That's an allocation. That would be my way of, of approaching it. Because um, I know they've made comments about OCP and, and things like that as well. So I'm going to go uh, Liam because he might have a response to that point, and then I'll go to Joyce right after that. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I do. And the revenue projections for development um, revenue is always tricky, and it's a bit of a crystal ball. Um, and so what we notice with our historical analysis is that we can have one individual housing project that skews the entire projection. So currently, there's one project underway that just the the value of that project you know, increased our revenue in last year dramatically just from one project. Yeah. And so um, what we're, we're not anticipating another project of that magnitude in this next year. And so it's possible that something like that could come forward and then we, you know, we get that increased revenue bump. But we try to be more conservative in that analysis and that projection. And then the other thing that we're seeing is a reduction on the number of um, like, not necessarily just new market construction, but renovation uh, and, and, and that type of uh, building permit request. And there, and there is an upcoming review, I believe, of, of DCC fees as well, right? No, yeah, development revenue. Development yeah. revenue, yeah. 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 Overall, that that may have some impact. But I guess my comment is that um, notwithstanding the bump, the level of staffing remains constant or higher um, based on the numbers versus that are de decreasing by 23%. So it's just a comment generally. And I guess if that makes sense, uh, I'd refer that back, but Joyce? And my comment is, I was worried this was going to happen if we stopped after revenue and yeah. did not go through the whole budget. Because, <clears throat> I mean, I just think that uh, when we take a look at what we're projecting to spend, that's the time for us to reflect on revenues. So I'd urge us to move forward. I think we've got a lot to talk about on the budget. I'm good with that. Okay. So if there's any not seeing any opposition, we let's move forward. Go okay. ahead, go ahead, Kristen. Thank you. Um, next slide is to just uh, give a high level overview of the use of statutory mm -hmm. reserve funds. So again, this is kind of another revenue to us. It's how we fund capital projects typically. Um, so in, um, in 2023, we are looking at, um, at using 1.5 million of statutory reserves and 1.3 in 2024, all the way up to 2027, where we're looking at the use of 1.5 million of statutory reserves. Um, for the most part, most of these, uh, the roads and infrastructure, the community parks, the capital renewal and replacement, um, those are to fund an annual envelope or an annual provision of funding for that department to undertake their capital program. Um, I'll just kind of talk about some of the unusual ones in here. We've got 
an extra 100,000 in capital renewal replacement in 2023, and that's to fund a one-time unusual um, expenditure uh, for the uh, work down at the works yard to do uh, to undertake the um, the environmental work and to uh, look at funding getting a temporary space for staff uh, to get them out of that um, that building. The land opportunity that's principal on the long term uh, community lands loan, and we make. A contribution to that fund each year from Cove Bay to repay the borrowed use of the land opportunity reserve funds. And well, why we, is that called a contribution rather than a loan repayment? I guess we could call it that, Councillor Morris. It's an internal loan, so typically a loan repayment is paid to an outside third party. But this yeah, is but it it makes it look to the reader that we're actually taking tax revenue and contributing it to the fund. We're taking um, money from the Cope Bay uh, uh, Fund and mm -hmm. contributing it to the Land Opportunity Reserve Fund. Then we pay out $42,000 in uh, principal repayment on the long-term $2 million uh, community lands loan. Um, community Works Funds. This is a, a, it's an interesting fund. It's uh, a fund that we get about $70,000 a year of funding, and it's, it's what... Um, is typically referred to as the gas tax money. Most of all of the gas tax money in BC for the gas tax in, um, in uh, the lower mainland, in the Metro Vancouver regional municipalities, all of those gas tax funds go to fund TransLink and roads and, and bridges and transportation in Metro Vancouver. There's a little bit that comes direct to each municipality. And we currently have been getting over the last decade or so, we've been getting about 65 or $70,000 a year. The last year of this gas tax fund money is, um, is in 2023. And the agreement is now up for renegotiation with uh, the province and the feds. So this is actually an opportunity for council to advocate that more of that gas tax money be directly used to support municipalities instead of being um, amalgamated and, and used to um, just given to TransLink. It's interesting when you see other communities across the province, the amount of infrastructure works that they're able to fund <coughs> as they receive a direct, um, a direct amount of, of uh, community works funding. And this is something just being part of Metro Vancouver based on that arrangement that we it's used for to support TransLink that um, that, that community works funds um, is not available to us, only a very small portion of it. So in this budget, we are um, planning to use those. We used it last year to fund the uh, stormwater project on Trunk Road. And we are proposing this year to use it to help with the proposed compost project. Um, and that's, uh, I think that's all that is interesting in, in uh, the use of statutory reserves. Joyce, did you have a hand, hand up for a raise? Okay, just wanna make sure. Thank you. Continue. Please. The use of non-statutory reserves. These are um, these are really actually allocations of accumulated surplus. Uh, they are um, just internal allocations of accumulated surplus. So we have uh, climate action funds uh, in 2023. We have last year's money and this year's money, and we are proposing that those funds be accessed to um, help fund the on-island composting if council does agree to go ahead with that project. $200,000 of accumulated surplus we are proposing um, to use. And that is um, that is required one um, for sort of a one-time um, startup at, at um, the community center. We know that there are going to be unbudgeted costs that we're going to incur moving our entire facility down to the community center. We've got probably additional tech, tech equipment, there's going to be move costs, there's going to be probably a whole lot of um, perhaps storage or document um, destruction costs. There's that generator outside. So we just we just haven't quite um, 
captured what the actual cost to move municipal hall down to the community center are. So I've put an allocation in there of 100,000 to um, capture one-time costs. There's another um, um, use potentially of accumulated surplus and that relates to the, um, the sewer construction project. Um, Back in June 12th, the report went to council that when the contract was awarded to Chandos to undertake the work, uh, there was some additional funding required to, um, uh, to pay for that project. And I was tasked with coming back to council at a later date to determine just how, how to fund that um, additional cost. So at this point, I'm really waiting for that project to wrap up. Um, I just wanna find out what the actual, actual cost is going to be before I come back to council with a recommendation on, on a cost allocation between general fund, sewer fund, and have council um, have that opportunity to have that conversation and make that decision. But in the meantime, I have put 100,000 provision in case there's additional costs to um, finalize that uh, mm -hmm. sewer project. It's almost wrapped up now. It's um, probably another month. Uh, use of the remaining COVID grant funds, um, that is earmarked for community center construction. Incomplete works fund, um, there is an allocation in there for 215,000 to uh, contribute towards the municipal contribution of the multi-use path for this year. There's the remaining 60 for the works yard for the, uh, the trailer component. Um, 100,000 will be needed to finalize Harding Road, the bridge that was constructed um, that needs to be paved when the weather turns um, nice again. And as well, there's some hydro seeding and some additional work uh, to finalize the Trump Road project from last summer. And additionally, we uh, believe that there is uh, outstanding um, about $75,000 to finalize the um, fire hall. There was some work done on the access road between mm -hmm. the fire hall and the health center. Uh, we are earmarking $75,000 for that work and it is a cost shared project. So we've put uh, $37,500 and uh, propose using it from those carry forward funds to pay for the municipal contribution of that. You see the 165,000 of uh, known donations that we have in the municipality, as well as um, 20,000 uh, to work on beach access um, in the parks and trails department, then that would be funded from uh, a one-time amenity contribution that the municipality received. And lastly, uh, the civic facilities fund. Uh, we anticipate uh, with this budget that there will be 1.3, just over $1.3 million in that fund. That comes from uh, a carry forward balance that we had for the last two years of 260,000. In the 2022 budget, council agreed to uh, make a contribution into that fund of $500,000. So that is in there. In the 2023 budget, Last year, I recommended that council do it again in 2023. I've included it in this budget in 2023 that council make a second contribution of 500,000 to that fund. And recently in January, we received an amenity contribution from um, the King Edward Bay development for 128,000 that has been put into that fund. So there is uh, potentially 1.3 million in that fund, again, to be used for construction costs for community center. Um, any questions or should I continue? Please continue. Oh, Allison. The access to the C fund. Um, is there more than one donation that went in, amenity contribution that went into that? Um, I don't I'm remember. If it's, if it's the Goodwill one, and I thought that was 100,000. Yeah, and I thought that was used to build the years. stairs to Pebbly Beach at CRC. Um, I'll have to I'll have to check into it. We there is no there's nothing in the uh, parks capital plan at this point that that um, identified that as a project. And I guess given the current situation, no, no, it was done. Like oh, we, this was well, like, then it was never. Sorry, I wasn't aware. It was not accessed. Then it was paid for some other way because it's still yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll I'll make a note to follow up with you because 
there was a hundred thousand dollar donation and yeah. that was also at the time they wanted to build the access down to pebbly beach at crc and my understanding is that part of that money was used for that so maybe somebody else has made an access and see donation since there is another one um i don't know i know i'm saying there is another one for forty five thousand dollars but i haven't um i haven't uh, identified any uh, pressing needs for that one at the moment okay i'll leave that one then thank you but they're all in the same fund no, they're set up in different ones. It's on the non-statutory reserve fund schedule okay. provided. All right, we'll talk about that offline. Okay. okay. Um, operating expense budget for uh, 2023 to 2027. Um, uh, so uh, again, the uh, the salaries and benefits have been inflated at an estimate of four percent for 2023 and three percent in the um, ensuing four years. Um, when we as staff go through to develop these operating expenses, we we don't start with what we had last year and say, oh, we'll just add three percent to this. We look at every single account and we um, <clears throat> consider what our needs are for the coming year, and we start. From a zero-based perspective, so every year what we what we put in there is our best estimate of what it's going to take to to um, run the operations for for um, a given year. Now, um, in the mayor and council line item for this year, um, we believe that there is going to be increased demand for um, professional development and training opportunities. We've added. Um, a $20,000 into that budget to accommodate um, increased uh, attendance at conferences and things like that. Um, admin and finance last year, if you recall, there was a, a very one-time $75,000 expenditure for the um, finance consultants that we had engaged to assist with pulling together the year end. So that has been taken out. Um, some has been put back. Our audit, um, our auditors have let us know that they're increasing their fees by about eight thousand dollars from last year. Uh, we've also um, taken on a new payroll software uh, program, which is now it's outsourced by ADP, so we're not um, reliant on this very antiquated payroll software program anymore. There's um, fees associated with that about. Um, uh, $12,000 uh, a year to uh, have our payroll outsourced to ADP. Um, fire and emergency, the budget actually dropped last year uh, from last year because there were two significant one-time grant funded mm -hmm. uh, projects in that budget line item. So you see it looks um, pretty strange to drop from 935 down to 714. But there's also been added... Um, costs, excuse me, relating to the new fire hall, that uh, that whole building has added costs that were not ever um, even, we didn't even incur them at the old site. You know, it's, it's in the sewer district, it's in the water district. We now have water and sewer fees to pay annually on that building. Um, it's also um, got more complex systems that the other one didn't have. So we need to set aside money for um, you know, inspection of the um, HVAC systems and replacement of filters and, and things that we just never had in that uh, very old building before. So there are um, quite a few additional costs to run the new fire hall. Um, community planning um, is really just a, a, a staffing budget, plus um, there's some software and some subcontract fees for mapping and, and title search, that kind of thing. Bylaw services is down because we did have um, a 0.5 manager of bylaw, which is um, is not been replaced at this point. We are actually considering repurposing that half FTE for the um, HR coordinator position. Public works is um, one of the really big budget line items. And I've also added an allowance for additional costs that may come with having this new um, um, trailer on site. I, I always think there's going to be one time 
fees or additional hydro or, or something, something that we weren't anticipating. So I, I put an extra uh, $15,000 in that budget just in case there's other things resulting from that, um, that new trailer site, if that goes ahead. <clears throat> Solid waste uh, should not uh, change significantly from year to year. Um, the rec budget, uh, we have added, um, oh, sorry, I have to look at that one. Oh, it's well, we've added um, additional programming revenue uh, in community rec. Last year's budget was still, we were taking a very conservative approach. We were still kind of coming out of COVID when we were um, developing that budget. We've increased the, the anticipated uh, program revenue from community rec. And with that, then the cost to um, bring on the instructors and the programmers to, not the programs, but the, the instructors <laughs> to deliver those programs is um is goes up by um a rel a, a relative amount as well um community parks uh a same thing um there is some savings in that budget uh year over year because uh we did fill the manager position internally that fte has um has not been replaced it has been increased a little bit because uh, the prior position was a 0.8. Now um, that position is uh, a full 1.0. And we've taken the other um, FTE savings from that budget and we've kind of tucked it into um, a professional fees allowance in case there's a need for a qualified environmental professional or somebody because we don't have that on staff anymore. So we likely will have to contract out for that. Uh, strategic initiatives is... Um, really is that budget where we kind of plunk things in that we don't quite know where else to put them. There is provision to undertake an OCP process this year as well. There is um, continued work on the asset management plan included within that budget line item. And the last one then, the new one is the uh, budget that we have started for facility operations and that, um, and that will ramp up as the facility is open for a full year, but um, we've got some costs in there for a partial year for this year. Uh, did anybody want to talk about the operations? Any questions? No? Over the five-year planning period, um, we're looking at operating increases of about 12.36% for the entire five-year period. Our capital expenditures are the biggest chunk out of our budget. Um, we kind of, I've kind of broken it into a couple of different sections. So this first section along the top, these are the amounts that are the annual envelope projects. So um, in 2023, we are proposing that Patrick will have a million for new capital and there's a hundred thousand in there to finish um, those other projects that uh, the Harding Road Bridge and the, the Trunk Road. So there's there's money in there to um, complete those projects for uh, the Public Works Department. Um, parks capital between uh, the use of parks and trails uh, reserve fund and the beach access funds. Uh, we've put an envelope amount of funding in there of about $70,000 a year. Um, we will need um, some uh, uh, additional uh, furniture, equipment, and IT this year. Um, there is money uh, to undertake part two of the website um, upgrade. There's $30,000 in there to do the part two of the website enhancements and $20,000 for our ongoing IT re um, replacement and replenishment. And same with fire, they do an annual allowance uh, for turnout gear and replace their small equipment, that kind of thing. So those have been um, just established as, as an annual provision for those sort of ongoing capital things. And then um, we get into sort of the more unusual one-time capital um, expenditures. So uh, first of all here, um, Chief has uh, indicated the need to undertake uh, replacement of another fire truck. 
Uh, the cost of that is estimated to be 395,000. He, just before he left, he went on holiday this week. Um, he has left me with a report that I will add to the material that goes to council next week. Um, it's a business case to um, establish what uh, uh, what the need for that replacement for that vehicle is. I understand it's a 1978 <laughs> um, piece of equipment. So I don't think he has to go too far to explain the need for that. Um, yeah, I think one thing, uh, Chris, and just to historically as it relates to the, the fire department, mm -hmm. is we've had to ensure that replacement has taken place to protect our the insurance position mm -hmm. and certification. So I guess that would be an element that may not apply to that specific piece of equipment, but it's just something for reference. Right. Because we've had to talk about that because the last purchase uh, was fairly critical in terms of retaining our certification. With the fire underwriters. Yeah. 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 Just a thought. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, next line is the service yard upgrade. There's been a lot of uh, conversation with council at this point. Uh, the last council meeting, council directed staff to include 160 in the budget for consideration. So we've got the 160 here, and that is to undertake the environmental work as well as replace the trailer. In 2025, I've added 3.5 million. Um, and that is to, uh, if the project goes ahead, that is to allocate an expenditure there for the um, full cost of replacement of those aspects of the public works yard. Um, and that has been considered to be funded by debt. So that will add, if that goes ahead, that will add 196,000. Um, per year starting in 2026 to the debt servicing. Um, the multi-use path is uh, interesting. We've got 815,000 in this year's budget to undertake additional work on the multi-use path. We did receive a grant for $500,000 from um, from the active transportation program. So that's a 70-30 cost share. The province picks up the 70% um, and we have to come up with 30%. We also have $100,000 of leftover approved grant funding from um, a federal grant that has um, we could still access and that's 100% funding. So in total, uh, if we had 500,000 grant funded through, through this um, active active transportation grant, 100,000 funded through, um, through this leftover uh, federal government grant. That would leave us with $215,000 of our own funds that we would need to use to fund the project worth $815,000. So um, I have included that in the budget and the 215,000 mm -hmm. um, is a use of that carry forward funding that we saw on an earlier page. In year two, um, 752,000 of additional work on the multi-use path. We've got that um, included in the budget. That was a, is a 50-50 grant program. So the municipality would be required to fund 370,000 of that total project cost. And that has been included um, through actually through use of um, increased property taxes. So we're, we're talking about taking operations funding and putting that into the capital fund to fund um, the municipal share of most of the municipal share. It's um, 215 municipal share and um, 80,000, which is the leftover money from that carry forward fund. So, so that's one of the drivers of the property tax increase for 2024 budget is, um, our work on the munis on the multi-use path. In the outer years, uh, I put in more multi-use path work. Um, and again, I had these, this is um, in 25, 26, and 27. The grant money is unconfirmed. It's really mm -hmm. putting it there as a placeholder, something to signal, and the funding for that 500 from the active communities grant municipal share would be 215 and the municipal share again is it's coming from tax revenue so so those are very 
they're they're not confirmed. They're really just out there as uh, potentials or options for council to consider. Can I ask a question on the multipath? Yeah. The, I mean, obviously, the success of the, the phases we've had to date are because of grant source funding uh, to make it happen. In terms of 2023, is that 500,000 confirmed? Yes. So that's going to happen. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm going to make sure of that. Mm -hmm. I think the point is, I mean, it was it's been identified kind of you know general conversation that this could become a multi-year 10 to 12 million dollar project over time. Is it mm -hmm. it's, it's way to wherever it's going to go across? And I guess the question is, is this approved then by council on a phase by phase basis for each uh, in each year? So I mean, I think it's a it's a position that council would have to take and report upon um annually as each phase was being contemplated is that correct i just want to make sure uh liam yeah so the project from a conceptual point of view has uh conceptually been blessed to go from the ferry terminal to bowen bay road um and but then each phase that gets advanced comes uh to council for approval to advance and we seek grant funding for the majority share of each phase. Um, and there is a portion of the trail that will be constructed at the expense of the Grafton Lake Lands development as okay. part of the agreement of that subdivision. Mm -hmm. And um, so when we are looking at the remaining phases to get to Bowen Bay Road, it's approximately four kilometers or so for what the municipality is responsible for. And it's roughly about a million dollars a kilometer, uh, depending on mm -hmm. the complexity of that phase. Yeah. And, and so we're looking somewhere between four and five million dollars of municipal uh, path to still build. And we would be looking to ideally have uh, two thirds of that finance through grants. And, and, but again, you're right, every phase comes before council. Yeah, and as I said, uh, I mean, decisions can be made depending on funding sources at that time and the overall financial position. So that was, I, I was comfortable with that as long as I understood at least for next year that we had some committed position, mm -hmm. that, it, that, it was, it, that it was locked down. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, capital hall, uh, capital expenditures to wind up the remaining work at the fire hall. We've included at 75. I indicated we um, expect this to be a cost shared uh, expense. Community center construction. I did, um, I did include uh, quite a um, comprehensive document to explain where the remaining funds are coming from to finish this project. We have. 10.5 million of confirmed funding to finish this $12.6 million expenditure. That leaves us with a funding gap of 2.1 million. We are diligently uh, working with our fundraising team to, um, to raise those additional funds. And we are um, just waiting in limbo for the announcement to come on the Canada Cultural Spaces Grant. So in the event that neither of those two funding sources um, are, are, are result in any additional funds, in the budget documents, I have included a potential alternative funding proposal. This again needs to be revised now based on the um, significant announcement today that we've learned with additional fund rate um, through the Growing Communities Fund. So I think I'll just leave that one for now and um, the committee can talk about that at the end of this uh, presentation. The uh, I, just a quick comment. The, yeah. uh, I think that there'd be, a, a, at least from my view, a reluctance uh, to enter into a boring arrangement for that recognizing the, the cost to the municipality at the yeah, identified as 3.3 percent yes and to me that would be something mm -hmm. over the course of the next year or two would be not terribly palatable so there are alternatives now that 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 exists so i think there's options open that maybe you might want to discount that borrowing position 
I just don't know that that, that it, it is not that may get some un, unappreciated attention on that point. Yes, it's not included in the plan. I understand, but it's it's the it's the alternative, right? Yeah. Is, but maybe there's alternatives before that. Correct. <laughs> Based on the new funding source or potentially available. Correct. Okay. I'll My recommendation to council would be to access that source of funding before any additional borrowing, certainly. So um, I think there just might be a pushback on that. Recognizing it would impact um, taxpayers directly in, in terms of their annual increase. If there was additional borrowing, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. In future periods. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the on-island composting project. So this is an interesting project. Um, we brought it back. We brought it back for a couple of reasons. We are considering an, an alternative technology. Uh, it's got a less expensive capital outlay of 1.3 million as opposed to almost 1.6 um, million. And we, um, we would be required for a one third municipal contribution. But we've also identified additional funding sources that we didn't have last year when we were talking about this project. So those climate action funds um, of $68,000 per year, we know that we will be receiving those for 2022, 2023, and 2024. So that represents um, um, a good part of money and a, a very... Um, um, symbiotic use of climate action funding would be to invest it into an on-island compost project. So uh, there's that money. And as well, we have no, we know we have one additional year of community works funds, which can be used for solid waste projects as well. So that's um, a source of internal funding that we believe we can um, fund this project with, whereas last year we were looking at additional borrowing. So, so a lot of things have changed about this project. And um, um, we believe that looking at the construction budget and then taking a look at the new operating plan, given that there are no debt servicing costs associated with it, mm -hmm. is something that needs to be done. We'll bring that back to the finance committee and get a recommendation to go forward uh, to council and let council decide at that point if this is a go or no go um, project, if they want to uh, give the grant back. Nothing's been expended on it. We haven't received any of the funding. So there wouldn't be any, um, there would be no repercussions if we simply didn't accept the grant and didn't proceed with the project. But certainly with the new information, it's something that should be reconsidered or looked at, evaluated again. Um, in your budget material, there is uh, something called an alternative capital expenditure. So very late in the game this week, um, it was Patrick, our director of engineering, has really um, made it known that there are two capital projects that are really high priority that really need to be included in this budget. Uh, one of them is the Carter Road Bridge replacement. The total estimated cost for that project is $850,000. And in the alternative um, budget package that I gave you, those are the, the documents with the brown and green on them. Uh, it's considered that this project be um, funded through use of capital renewal and replacement funds. And the second project is, um, excuse me, a very significant uh, roads project at Woods Road that um, is estimated. He has not got any formal cost estimates on this, um, on this project, but his high level estimate would be that a million dollars needs to be funded. And I've included that as, um, as being funded through additional contributions to the roads and infrastructure reserve. So again, that would be additional property taxes going to fund that reserve and um, and be able to fund that project over two years, 25 and 26, I think. Um, just have a look at what our general fund debt service costs. This is just based on what's in the budget. They are, um, this does not include debt service related to the Blue Water or um, if the Eco Cliff grant is successful, any of the um, 
any of the copay debt. This is just the general fund debt that's shared equally by all taxpayers. So it's about $660,000 per year. And then uh, you'll see in 2026, it increases by um, about 196,000. And that is relating to the uh, provision for additional debt that I've included from um, including the public works yard in the, in the five-year capital plan. It's important that council is aware of what the liability servicing limit mm -hmm. estimates are. So given what we have right now, we're sitting at about 33.9% usage of our debt service liability servicing limit. Potentially, if we add in the um, additional uh, 3.1 million from Blue Water, if we're successful on the Eagle Cliff grant also requires borrowing, that would be an additional 750,000. And if we include um, potentially the works yard over 30 years, that would add another 548,000 annually. So that would put us right at 50%. Um, potentially in the very more long-term uh, capital plan, we could be looking at an additional 2 million for Eagle Cliff phase two, another 2 million for Blue Water phase four, and up to $6 million to undertake phase two of the wastewater treatment plant. So there is, in the longer term, um, have to save room for, um, for additional borrowing to, uh, to service up to perhaps an additional $10 million of debt. And um, were that to happen, we would be uh, pushing 63, almost 64% of mm -hmm. our liability servicing limit. So Okay, we have a few questions, Kristen. Okay. Uh, Joyce, you were first, followed by Andrew, then John. Um, I jumped the gun. This is exactly what I wanted to know. Um, and I guess the only question I would have is, how is that calculated? How is our liability servicing limit calculated? Is it based mm -hmm. on what our revenues are? What is right. it? Yes, it's recalculated every year, and it's based on what our own revenues are. So grant money and things like that aren't included, but it's what our property tax revenue, our, our, our fee revenue, all of that kind of stuff is amalgamated together. And 25% of that becomes our annual uh, liability servicing limit. So we can't spend more than 25% of that revenue on debt and interest payments on long-term loans. God forbid, what happens if, um, when was it that my interest rate for my mortgage was 18%, that was yeah. 1982, <laughs> I believe. Yeah. Um, properties did drop, interest rates went through the roof. What happens to us as a municipality if we do have a huge shift in real estate? Uh, luckily, those types of debts are locked in, so they're not going to be subject to interest rate risk. They're um, subject to, they're held for 10 years. They can't be old. So if they happen to open up in the, uh, they're, they're refinanced at the end of a 10 year period. So if we happen to be in the 10, 10th year and we had to refinance and interest rates were through the roof like that, yet yeah, we would potentially be um, looking at some pretty significant increase usage of our liability servicing limit. And I would be interested to see what kind of, um, is Liam still here? I mean, has there been any experience with municipalities that are very close to their limits or? Oh yeah, um, there are municipalities that run right up against it. And um, Kristen's right in that, there's more security in the municipal finance authorities loan programs than in uh, like a, a conventional home mortgage uh, scenario. And the liability limit is set to protect municipalities from being coming overextended. If we found ourselves in a global economic situation where the rates were climbing to such extreme heights, I can't say with any certainty, but it's, it's entirely possible that the provincial government may be able to relax some of those limits and or provide some 
um, the leak. And the, the other thing to keep in mind too is that the municipal finance authority is able to achieve incredibly low rates. Um, there's no other financing authority like it in North America. Uh, and it often will achieve better credit scores than, than other provincial governments. And sometimes it's better than our own provincial government that consistently gets AAA ratings from uh, Standards and Poor's and Moody's and, and the likes. So they're able to maintain a really low rate. It's good to keep an eye on though, uh, but I, I don't think we have to be too worried. Okay. Andrew, John, then Judy. Uh, thank you. Uh, are you able just to go back one slide? This one? Yes. I'm just curious what um, was the cause of the difference between the total debt service in the budget of 2022 and the unaudited? This is just general fund. Sorry. This is just general fund. But when we consider yeah. our live, but we have to include our water funds as well. Um, okay. These are local service areas, though, and we'll deal with those in the local service area budgets. But yeah, when we look at the limits overall, that's the difference. Great. Thank you. Okay. John? Thank you, Fred. Uh, I, I, are we ending at three? I guess, are we going to run out of time? Because I had sort of comments on the attachment to the agenda by page number which of course isn't correspondent. Yeah, originally we had actually planned to go to 3.30. Uh, That's in the um, event, the calendar event as well, 3.30. Okay. That was the intent. So yeah, the, yeah, the, the uh, agenda itself doesn't have a reflection of the actual time frame. So we were planning to, as I said, to go to 3.30, John. Okay, the, just on the long-term debt then, the potential new long-term debt I think where it says Bowen Blue Water Park phase uh, four, I think we should also add Bowen Bay because we're, you know, we, we've made it quite clear we're not going to shy away from our eventual need to replace our pipes. And I think there are other water systems that probably are facing the same pipe replacement dilemmas that um, should be, a, you know, envisioned. So, because if, if suddenly we get, to a cap on our borrowing and Bowen Bay suddenly it comes to roost and we have leaks and problems, uh, we're, we're, we, we, we need to protect our position. Uh, so I just wanna point that out. Um, and uh, just in terms of that interest rate discussion, I mean, it is difficult if, if for instance, our, our costs go up 250,000, I think it means a 4% tax increase on the property tax side, because most of the other revenues won't change. So we are pretty sensitive to an interest rate change in terms of impact on our um, actual property tax um, you know, um, budget. And then lastly- just... They are fixed for um, eight years though. Good, oh good, okay. So within the context of this particular plan, there is little interest rate risk there. Uh, longer term, yes, agreed. Okay. And that's okay, then point. later on, I'll have, once we get through this, uh, I have questions on the individual pages of the uh, agenda attachment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, on this slide, um, the only potential adjustments, um, it seems to me would be uh, if community lands were sold, yeah. that would change those numbers in terms of the debt servicing, it could be paid down in the capital or something. Unfortunately not. It's been nope. locked in okay. and we're we're in that long-term loan for okay. another, um, I think, seven years on that one. When it opens up um, in seven years, there's 1.8 million relate, uh, principal um, owing on that debt. When that opens up, we, um, we, will, we are required to use the land opportunity funds to pay any principal down because that money was earned from the sale of the lands. It has to be applied first to the debt reduction. Okay. And then there will be um, potential new long term. Um, you've just mentioned a million something that uh, Patrick has identified for roads and bridges mm -hmm. and um, the horrendous potential um, for borrowing it for the community center. Those numbers are not included in here anywhere. 1.8 million is uh, 
in the alternative capital plan for the extra Woods Road, uh, Carter Road Bridge has been funded um, through reserves and property taxes. So there's not additional mm -hmm. debt arising from that. And uh, community center would be additional debt if that was the way that council wanted to go to fill that fundraising gap. Right. Uh, it's completely at the at the decision of council. How so that would are. potentially so be in the long uh, term, the last category. <clears throat> yeah, there are some alternatives available though. Got it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands. Um, please proceed, Kristen. I can finish this quite quickly. So yep. contributions to statutory reserves year over year, I've detailed those. Um, again, funding, um, we need to make funding available for that annual envelope for capital <clears throat> projects. And what, what we want to see, and I'm gonna skip through this, what we want to see over time is this gap widen. So the green line you can see is how we're using reserves. And the blue line is how much we're putting into reserves. So anything in that gap in between those two lines becomes growth in the annual um, reserve balances. We want to we want to see that continue to climb. You see in this proposal, there's um, a, a big dip into reserves in 2025. And that is to fund that um, engine 32 fire fire truck. Um, I think I'll I think I'll leave it. Um, Can I just ask one little question? It's a small item. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Transfers to uh, yeah. like you identified for the for example the library fund. Yes. Um, it's an increase of uh, almost twenty percent. Yes. And I'm just curious as to why that might occur at this time, considering some of the other pressures that are in place. Yeah, the library is a bit of an anomaly. Um, if you look at the library uh, salaries budget year over year over year, there's a, a steady and predictable increase with their service adjustments and with um, you know COLA adjustments and things. I think with the um, absence of the uh, chief librarian, there was a bit of um, a bit of a mistake made in the budget in 2022. Uh, and certainly when I came on last year, that budget had already been presented to their board and approved. It had already been presented to our council. I didn't do the due diligence probably that I should have to go through all of their numbers. I really just incorporated it into the, um, into the municipal five-year plan. And about halfway through the year, um, it became really obvious that there was some mistakes in their budget estimates for salaries and that they were going to be significantly over budget by the time the year came. So they ended up shifting, they ended up um, deferring expenditures that they otherwise would have made to make sure that they came in on budget. But that is um, that budget error has been corrected. Tina and I have worked quite closely together to um, ensure that her salary figures are correct for 2023 and beyond. And that is, um, that's the reason for the, it's, it's really a two year jump in one year, but it's because of a, a, a very obvious budget error that was made in the estimates last year, unfortunately. Yeah, it's just, I mean, over time that, that number will, will increase. I know uh, as a result of COVID, um, they had to um, eliminate their volunteer force and replace yes. it with paid paid employees. Yes. And I guess I don't know the fact that we're sort of past the initial COVID phase, whether that will change or not. And I also think previously there was also improvements to the build within the building itself that were identified mm -hmm. uh, that um, may or may not have been supported to proceed with at that point. I don't know, but it's just, it's just, a, it's just one of those things. There's, because as a number, as I say, it's not that significant dollar-wise, but it does kind of represent a fairly significant percentage year over year, even yeah. with the deferments that may have occurred the past year. Yes. I'm yeah. so good at that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 2023 includes, I think I mentioned earlier, um, a, a potential for 100000 to uh, cost share the added um costs for completing the contract with uh, the general contractor. 
And um, in mm -hmm. from sewer fund, this is, if you recall there, there was a repayment plan for a portion of the money that was transferred to the sewer fund last year. So that is a parcel tax that is levied and transferred from the sewer fund into the general fund each year. Um, it was in place for seven years. So it's included in each of the five years of this plan. And there's a, a difference there. Um, we do uh, charge overhead costs back to water utilities. Um, in 2022, we added some funding for that because of the installation of the, um, the uh, trailer at the uh, sewer treatment plant that is a building that's used by all of the water crew and it stores um, uh, small equipment and materials as well. So it's, a, it's really a shared facility. It is located at the water treatment plant, but it's a shared facility for all of the utilities. So we did um, charge the utilities back with some extra money to offset the costs of putting that building there. And in 2023, there's an extra payment um, being charged to Cove Bay in relation to a piece of equipment that will be used uh, to deal with the material, the byproduct of the water treatment plant, it has to be moved from the treatment plant to um, a site. So, so there's um, kind of like a municipal donation of, uh, of some kind of handler piece of um, fleet equipment to, to do that. Yeah, so that's why there's a difference in the one year yep. there. Um, yeah. It's our reserve fund expected closing balances under this plan where we'll be from 2023 through 2027. And um, just graphically what that looks like for our statutory reserve funds. Uh, Your projection here, does that include the additional two projects or the, the additional expenditures that were identified? It doesn't. So this is um, the original plan. I'm getting all excited that the numbers were, I know. were looking so good. No, but they are. They are. Um, I did include them in that. There's, <laughs> there's a new number put there in the um, alternative statutory reserve fund balance with those two projects included. So that that material is included with the agenda package. I just don't Yeah, because that was always something that I'd raised previously at my at my of the importance of building those reserves. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That was my last slide. Was it? Uh, yeah, just where where we see them going year over year. So, so opening this year um, with six point four between our two sets of statutory non statutory general reserves. We don't have water funds included here for this discussion, but um, we're gonna dip into them for sure in 2023 to get this um, community center built. And the plan is to start building them back and, and um, increasing the value of those reserves because that is what is going to provide us with protection and resiliency and the ability to, um, you know, to deal with our huge infrastructure costs that are um, staring us down in the future. So that is, that is it for me. And I'll stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. I just have one question as it relates to oper um, the operating statement projected for the community center going forward. I mean, I think it was understood that that's sort of a starting point overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that could change fairly significantly, potentially. Yeah. Going forward. Mm -hmm. So, but that's just a placement to allow you to, to identify. Uh, potential impact at this point? Yeah, I, I think it was really important for us to identify that, again, this is a new public sophisticated building with sophisticated systems that we aren't typically used to having to look after. We're not, we're not used to having to look after fire suppression systems. We don't have them in any of these buildings. We don't yeah. have HVAC, sophisticated HVAC and costs. So, you know, really we just pulled out every system and, and, put some budget provision in for it. And I think it'll take a couple of years of operating that building before we have a really good handle on, on what the annual maintenance and operations costs are. Yeah. I think at some point, maybe a, the FSC had understood that that may come back to us once we get closer to the, the number, what the real numbers, the final numbers would be, just for to provide some input. Or we've already actually, I guess my question is, is that still the intent or have you you've moved beyond that stage at this time? 
as it relates to that budget. Because we'd identified, uh, maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it, we, we thought that that would be brought back to us at some point prior to um, uh, it being put in a more finalized version. Okay, well, we can certainly um, bring it back and look at it at the next meeting again. Um, we do have a couple of opportunities to um, make some edits or some updates before the budget goes for final. But you're, you're right, it's, the significant, it's a significant operation. And um, for the for the municipality as it relates to mm -hmm. everything from you know contractual relationships to uh, revenue generation and yeah. those expenses, it just may, in my view, appear to be something appropriate for the committee that we'd identified earlier. And um, we may have opinions about a few things, and or could provide some support or input uh, to move to more of, to a finalized position. Yeah, um, we have another meeting. Uh, that we're trying to line up for next week, so we could look at it at that time. I don't know. Is that of interest to the committee at this point? I'll just ask committee members. I see a one nod at least. Anybody else? Okay. I saw, I saw a few nods, so I think I think you're not okay. All right, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. That's all. That's all I had on that particular point. Okay. Joyce, you have your hand up. You're on mute. Okay. I just have a, is it time for us to talk about the whole thing now? Are you ready? Um, or I'm, not? I'm, Are I'm we done? I didn't talk about police funding. So, okay. Let's not let yeah. that go okay. Did you want to speak to that then, Kristen? Um, Before we. Sure. I'll do it really quickly. Okay, thank you. Uh, police taxes now are collected through the provincial government uh, along with school tax. And they're on your, you see on your property tax notice, you actually see a line item for police tax. Apparently yep. that re uh, represents about 25% of the overall police costs to, um, to uh, provide policing service in our municipality. Um, but that formula is actually cost shared among the province as a whole. So the whole cost of providing rural policing to small communities in the province is amalgamated and then charged back to municipalities based on population. So there's a very high likelihood that it's not representative of what 25% of our actual policing costs are going to be. But as our community grows and as we, um, as we increase and, and get close to that $5,000 magic population size, we are gonna be on the hook or 70% of our policing costs. And, um, and my discussions with other communities that have crossed that threshold is there's not a whole lot of consultation. There's not a whole lot of preparation. There's, um, there's a bill that you get in the mail from, from um, the mm -hmm. province of BC and communities need to be prepared as they approach that threshold. And given that significant population growth that we experienced over the last few years, uh, we have to ensure that we are starting now to plan for that eventuality and have money at um, funding in a fund set aside. There are going to be additional costs likely uh, to acquire the, the assets. There's, there's three staff houses on Bowen Island for RCMP members, and then there's the detachment itself. So those are going to be a significant cost to um, figure out um, how to deliver policing on Bowen Island. It's going to be a significant cost and we need to start setting aside money now um, for that eventuality. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Liam, did you have a, a comment to that? Yeah, I just want to add on that. So last year I started uh, having meetings with RCMP about the costs and they've been sharing what they can, we need to understand what the true cost of operating RCMP on Bowen is. They did provide some clarity. So the housing that the members uh, live in are currently owned by the federal government and they're potentially subsidized for the members. That doesn't become a requirement uh, for the municipality once we hit that magic threshold number. Um, so, but it's something that the municipality needs to consider in terms of 
attracting and retaining good membership at the police force here on Bowen is when housing can be a real challenge, but it isn't actually our responsibility, but the detachment does become our responsibility. And so we've got a lot more detailed information that we can dig into and, um, but um, it is prudent to start planning now and considering saving sooner than later because the cost will be a big uh, change and impact to us. So. Okay, thank you. Allison, you had your hand up. You're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, is this for questions on the policing or general questions? I think you were probably at that point where that would be either. Go ahead. Okay, well, if anybody's got policing questions, maybe we should just do them first and then uh, if not, I'll- Yeah, the only other hand up is John. Do you have a policing question, John? No. Okay, um, so just going back and uh, sort of finding my notes. On the general government detail, and I'm into the package you sent us. Mm -hmm. um, just a minute, let me get back into that page. The departmental plans, mm -hmm. um, under general government, I'm curious as to why there's no salary and benefits for 2023, 2024, and 2025. There's no staff in that department. It's really just supplies and services costs to run municipal hall. There's a one time every, that's just um, election workers uh, in every four years. So we put that. Okay. Yeah. All right. That answers that one. Um, so the, for the facility manager, is there a draft job description? Not yet. We're working on it. Okay. Um, okay. I think. Yeah, I, I'd have to scroll through. I've got my questions on each budget sure. now. Okay. And the only other is in the mayor and council budget. I think your increase should be in 2027, not 2026, because the election in 2022, you've got the election, the increase in 2023. So four years out doing that similar calculation in 2026 election increase, professional development, et cetera, would be in 2027. Yes, in 2026, there will be additional costs for um, replenishing technology and stuff for mayor and council. Yeah. Our costs that we incurred um, with the last also depends on the turnover, right? If there's little turnover, yeah. you don't have to do as much. So, yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll move on to John. You can come back to you and I'll sneak you. Yeah, I just go to school. Yeah. So, John? Thank you, Fred. Uh, I guess certainly I have an in a concern about the proposed 13.3 <laughs> increase. Uh, question last year was the increase around nine percent it started out i believe at 12 we dropped it down to nine um we did include in our five-year plan last year that uh i think 12.6 was what we were looking at last year for year two so i mean it we knew yeah. right off the top that most of it was being driven by costs around the community center and the new debt so we yeah. had already Good yeah, so last year, what uh, we'd be looking at for a year or two. Yeah, and then last year we had a, I think it was a 2% change because there were 30 or 40 properties added to the assessment role, yeah. which helped dilute the, uh, so, but at any rate, I, I, I certainly, I think people will indicate there's a concern with 13.3% increase and whether we need to, I guess, ask the question, should we be looking at areas where we can reduce costs? Um, I'm not sure whether we want to discuss that now or later, but uh, certainly, I you know, we need to flag that. Maybe I'll discussion. hold that for the moment, I think. And okay. And I, I had a comment. question. Sorry, can I just make one reference to that point? Was that uh, Kristen indicated that the individual tax mm -hmm. uh, impact would be about 10% because of the additional development that was completed on island last year. So you're probably working off a base of 10% rather than 13, is it? in terms of, you know, people's pocketbooks individually. Okay. Okay, okay. did you have something else, John? Yeah, whereabouts is insurance costs? I know we insure through the province, but do we pay for that? Oh yeah, our insurance costs are significant. Like, and, yeah, so where, where are they? Where do they show up? I so they're sprinkled throughout, I mean, anything, any department that has assets, uh, any of their own, 
property insurance related to the assets are living within those departments. So public works has quite a bit of insurance costs. General government has uh, the liability component. There's about $45,000 of insurance costs sitting in there. And then, um, yeah, most of it, uh, parks has some insurance. Yeah, anywhere that there's uh, fire has quite a bit of insurance and also community center now. We've um, estimated that property live uh, the property insurance component for the community center will be about forty thousand a year. So all, all of the insurance costs are those like you're pretty confident that will be the cost for twenty twenty three or are these just estimates? Uh, no, they're prepaid. We um, okay. they are okay. yeah they're yeah. Okay. Um, then I noticed there was a reference in where we had some debt and one was Tunstall Bay floating debt. So yep. I guess that one was gonna fluctuate up and down. And so my question with, if the debt increases, does the charge to the property owners increase or who, who absorbs that cost? Um, I'm actually holding that one um, in short term for a reason. Um, that debt was originally done as a, a five-year um, short-term loan. So they wanted to the, the LAC, the community agreed to a five-year short-term loan. And then through the budget process last year, um, you know, people said, is there anything we can do about that? Can we open that up and, and make it a little bit longer? So whenever, um, whenever debt is taken on by a municipality, you can carry it in short-term, um, for five years before you lock it into the original long-term loan that you had agreed to, that you had agreed with the community to do. So given that they, um, the community kind of came back to us and said, hey, can you, can you extend the term of this loan a little bit? If we actually went for the closed short-term loan, we wouldn't have been able to extend it and thereby reduce the parcel tax on, on, um, on individual homeowners. So when we go to our meeting with um, Tunstall Bay, we're going to uh, just run the options by them that we can continue to float it in short term. There is interest rate risk, but what it does is actually extend the repayment term of that by another five years. So they can repay that loan over 10 years instead of what they've committed to, which is the five. So, you know, there's, there's risk there, but the benefit is that they, we can, reduce that annual collection okay. of the parcel tax because it was over then, 100. It was John, can I can come back to you? I think I want to just go. Um, okay, just a sec. There was, um, well, actually my big concern is the engineering budget. I think our, our, our engineer needs more help. There's a lot of projects coming and, uh, you know, the time that goes into managing these, the, the, the various LACs for sewer and, and water um, and the projects that are coming up, um, you know, I, I query, I know we're increasing staff in other areas, and I'm worried, of course, about the overall budget. But on the other hand, uh, maybe we're being penny, uh, pound foolish, penny wise mm -hmm. by scrimping on staff support for managing and tendering and envisioning and tracking these, these projects. So I... Um, you know, I, I, yeah, that that's a big worry for me, is because okay. we're we've got a lot of them coming down the line, and uh, uh, we we need to get. I think we should give that some thought. I mean, we're adding HR, but really one half person for HR. But I think you know, really, if we're adding anywhere, we need to add support for uh, for that. And then my last point is we are basing things on population projections. I think Bowen will grow quicker than we think because there's been conversion from vacation residences to full-time residences. Yeah. Certainly I'm one in the last <clears throat> census. The previous census, we were re re residing elsewhere. Uh, we're, we're now showing up as the census is residing in Bowen. So we're actually gonna cost money, Bowen money by doing that. We should actually <laughs> stay where we were. Oh. But, uh, but we're going to see more and more of that as uh, long-term families sell out their holdings. Most of the people, or a lot of people buying, are people who are going to occupy the home. So even though we won't be growing the number of dwellings, I I believe our population will continue to grow just on that factor alone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So John, you're part of the problem then. <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, Joyce. I, I have a general comment and a couple of specifics. So my general comment is uh, the community voted in favor of a, a loan for the community center and a loan for the fire hall. We all know that referendums. I'm worried that we are starting to look at ways of finishing off projects using taxpayers' money. And we're saying, well, it's not really debt. Uh, it's actually taxpayers' money. We're taking it from one to the other. But in the meantime, we're still having to incur debt in order to do other projects. And I am concerned about that. I think the optics are not good. I don't know what the solution is, but at the very minimum, we have to be upfront as a community with one another as to what is actually happening. So I caution about that. Um, I think it's incredible that we've actually received a large gift that may help us not do most of that. On the other hand, we've got huge uh, things that we have to do, and it would be lovely to apply that money to some of the things that are raising their ugly head. So uh, that's my major comment about the budget. Um, and I would just add that, thank heavens that the option that Kristen um, proposed with an additional 3.3% increase um, hopefully can be taken off the table with the generosity of some donations and maybe the generosity of provincial folks uh, helping us out. So that's one comment. And the more specific two comments that I have is, I think there are two departments that I'm worried about who are about to be overloaded beyond belief. I agree with John about the engineering department. I also think the planning department, if this parks uh, discussion goes very far, that our planning department is just going to be overwhelmed with challenges that they're going to have to take on. And I would add, I also believe the engineering department and public works will be overwhelmed by work that they're going to be facing. So I, I'm concerned about that. And the final one, as usual, is from out of the blue. I see in uh, the fire hall budget that there's been some learnings about heating our fire hall and maybe adapting our fire hall and trying to figure out new ways of heating it. What are we doing to apply that learning to our community hall before it's finished? Like, I, I think that that's another engineering question that needs to be applied um, to a construction a, a project that's under construction right now. Yeah. And Kristen, I have to say, this is the best budget presentation we've had in all the years that I've been on um, the Finance Advisory Committee. And I thank you. And I'm really glad that we waited to hear your presentation because you actually answered probably 75% of my questions. So thank you. Yeah, same thank here. you, Joyce. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, thank you. I would uh, concur with the... Joyce's comments about the community center, I think it's it's challenging because it feels like we're we're backfilling money that didn't exist in the first place uh, to get it. And as a result, when we have new money incoming, particularly in the form of grants or whatever it is, it's going to it's going towards an old project when we do have new projects that are on the horizon, particularly from an engineering standpoint. Um, my question is around uh, infrastructure and assets. And I'm curious, given so even in this presentation, we saw that there, there is some high priority projects identified by Patrick that have kind of come at the last minute. We know that over the past few years, there have been projects that have come at us out of the blue that have required funding or reallocation of funding. Um, and we know that we're at the very, well, not at the very start, but like in early stages of having a fulsome asset management plan. Um, and I'm curious, what is the ability of this budget and this forecast to withstand um, more projects like Patrick has identified or if other things come out of the blue um, and what the impact will be? So knowing that we're, you know, hovering around 10 to 13 percent or whatever it is, increase and then looking at it at a decrease, whether that's in actuality going to happen, given the track record that we have for these projects 
um, coming out of the blue or, you know, whether it's the trunk road or bridges or, or whatever it is and whether we need to be building in more of a contingency um, for those emergency type projects until we have um, a real detailed asset management plan. Okay. Liam, do you want do you want to do that? Do you want me to address that? I'll I'll take a first stab at it, and uh, <laughs> and then I definitely look for your input. I did want to just take a moment to acknowledge some of the comments from both John and Joyce. Those are really appreciated, and and one of my key um, principles around uh, working at the municipality is that. Staff are our number one asset. Like, you know, we can buy more tools, we can build more spaces, um, but it's really difficult to attract and retain good people. And it's becoming more and more difficult. And so I'm consciously aware of that every day and try to think about like, how do we make this place a good place to work that people want to show up and, and they see value in it and they want to stay. And, um, and so I'm conscious about, you know, burning them out. So I really appreciate that recognition and I, and uh, thank you for that. Um, and, and Mayor, your question about how does this budget, um, what's the capacity of this budget to sustain the increasing um, depreciation of our assets? It's a very good question. Uh, we don't know the answer with the precision and the detail that we'd like to. We, we're hopeful that by the end of this calendar year, that we'll be able to answer that better as we populate our new asset management software and build our asset management strategy out. Um, I do think that what uh, Kristen has built is quite strong and it is probably one of the best, if not the best, five-year financial plan that we've ever had and being really honest about what we know to be concerns and problems coming up in the five-year plan. And, you know, but uh, one of the things I think we're low on is the annual contribution to like what we call roads and infrastructure. So roads and culverts and rock scaling and things like that. Um, you know, anecdotally, we think we could double that, uh, and and that would be required to make sure we're in good repair with our primary access infrastructure. Um, and so, one approach could be looking at increasing a contribution to that, knowing from expert uh, uh, opinion and experience that. It's likely higher than what we've currently got. Um, or we wait until next year when we have better data through the asset management strategy and we can articulate a more precise number. Um, but I'm pretty sure that number around roads and infrastructure does need to go up. Okay. If, okay, thank you. Uh, before we go to Allison has a question, I'll just make a comment. I mean, the asset management plan is something that's had a few false starts uh, going back to when I joined this committee. And uh, I think that it really reinforces the fact of how critical it is to, uh, to addressing the financial future and impact on taxpayers going forward. So I appreciate the fact that it's getting the, the, perhaps being recognized for how important it is at this time. And I really support that. I think it's absolutely critical that whatever it takes to do it, it needs to be done. But there's been, as I said, uh, historically, there's been sort of um, something that hasn't happened. Um, so I, 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 I absolutely encourage that position. Um, the, uh, uh, Allison, did you have something at this point? Okay. And I'm just gonna say uh, as well, yeah, before we were coming to 3.30, we're, um, I think providing, I mean, maybe commentary, hopefully to support the, the board um, in their deliberations as it goes forward. I think that um, uh, if it's around realistically individual impact is around 10%, it would sure be nice to have that number other, under, under uh, double digits. But we actually expected that the um, community center was going to impact I think originally it was discussed around 7%, at least in the first uh, first period was kind of, and it hasn't 
quite hit that number. So, I mean, when you look at inflation and other factors, I mean, all that comes into play, the 4% adjustments overall um, on salaries and benefits and things like that, uh, it's going to have to be an, a higher number uh, than, than what people are, have, have normally uh, expected. But if uh, there's something that can be done to look at, you know, some sort of adjustment on, on things, but I think we can't allow deferment of things that are important in the community right now, because that's been kind of where we got ourselves to where we are today. And so I think that's really important that that gets addressed. And I also want to mention, uh, Kristen, great job. Thanks. And uh, I really appreciate your presentation and your overviews provided. So I didn't see any further comments, but I'll refer to Andrew. You have your hand up. Yeah, and I just wanted to name some of the regional pressures that are being uh, felt around the table as well as we start to see budgets come in from the regions and and, and figures come in from the regions and, and in terms of tax rate increases. And we are seeing uh, yeah. high than usual um, uh, increases coming uh, from major urban centers and the smaller ones of up to 18 percent, 15 percent, 14 percent. So I think we know that we're in a climate where uh, we might need to expect um, uh, a, bitter, a, a bit of a higher increase. Yeah, yeah, I've been looking at those as well, um, overall. I mean, I think even the city of Vancouver is 11% or something, if I recall. And yeah, that's just a fact of life right now. So uh, I think one last comment is, I'm very ple obviously pleased about the 2.28 million that's uh, gonna find its way. I think it's important that we apply the use of the monies judiciously and that we um, recognize that we don't want to burn it all off mm -hmm. too quickly, that we keep that in, you know, for, for the things that we're going to face as a community going forward. And it doesn't, so that it's used for really things that are of highest priority for the benefits of taxpayers on the island. And um, just a thought that, uh, yeah, I mean, the community center has absorbed a lot of those grant monies that have appeared, but I think we wanna make sure that we uh, don't over overutilize it. As I think Andrew, you identified for existing or previous projects that are underway, that we really wanna protect that position going forward because that can have a huge impact on the community. That's a lot of money. Judy? Is it reasonable at this point, um, at the end of this meeting, for us to go away from this and think about what um, possibly some of those priorities are? I like some of John's comments about the engineering, um, possibly instead of the HR, but I'm not sure yet, but um, figure out uh, what the priorities would be for the extra 2.8 million or 2.3 million, we budgeted 500,000, and um, or where there might potentially be cost savings in terms of any of these um, things we've talked about. Yes. Yeah. Simply our homework. Yeah, I might view that as a council responsibility <laughs> well, <laughs> rather than that. from this community because we're really looking at the financial implications directly, like mm -hmm. not in, not drilling into where, where that may occur. We're providing some general oversight or comments, but yep. um, I think it's probably something for council. Um, Liam? For sure. Yeah, th thank you, Fred. Um, and yeah, I think when we're thinking about staff and where staff is needed, I think council and this committee needs to be really thoughtful about that if they want to start to make recommendations of where and what departments actually need support. Um, I think that's primarily my role and I welcome input. Um, and discussion, I definitely welcome that. But I would just caution about having council or this committee, um, you know, sort of overriding a recommendation unilaterally and making a, a, a different recommendation. Um, I guess as chair of this committee, I, in other organizations that I work with as well, I mean, that's, I agree uh, with Liam's position. I mean, it's fine to provide you know some thoughts in, in terms of that, that position, but it ultimately is up to uh, management and council to make those decisions. So yeah, yeah, we're I'd be cautious about uh, at all about those types of recommendations. 
but recognize that um, the, the resources required um, um, will have to be allocated appropriately. And, and that's really the job of management, not coming from here. So I think, um, I'm sure who was first? Um, Joyce, I think I'll go first. And then else. Just a comment about that. I absolutely agree with you, Liam. But given the comments that have been made by a couple of us, and I did see a few nods as well, um, it, it might be interesting for you to say, to add another FTE or to an ad, you know, what does it cost us in terms of how would that change the budget? Um, and it, it would be educational perhaps for council to hear that. It's, Right, and if, and if you're and, not at a point where you even want to do that, then I defer to you totally for it. Right. Well, uh, two budgets ago, we brought forward an initial, uh, I believe it was six FTE requests, and we ended up with 0 0.8. And um, so the next year, we did get uh, another lift minor lift uh, and so the tone and um, experience has been for uh, minor lifts and the internal discussions that I've had with all of the department leads about FTE requirements I mean everybody could use more support no doubt right um, there's always need for more support but we definitely we are trying really hard to look internally too as to how can we better utilize the existing staff that we have. And um, can we like redeploy some of the folks uh, responsibilities to other areas? And HR is the one that continually comes up as being the, the it's the newest position and it's in the highest demand. Um, and we don't get to the strategic work that we need that position to work on the retention and uh, uh, the, the policy and the, and the uh, training and development opportunities for the entire organization. So that's why we believe that to be the most important one. But I definitely the public works and the planning and admin, like uh, across the board, there's, uh, there's pressure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Allison. I was just wanting to clarify. Um, the one FTE that I recall them being talked about was uh, 0.5 was not being replaced in bylaws and that was going to be replaced in um, HR. But is there a 0.8 FTE overall staff increase? Did I understand that from what Liam just said? Um, no, because there's a, um, there is, the manager of environment was filled internally and that position was not backfilled. But what we did do was take a provision of funding to support um, contract professional if we need that service. Okay, well, what was the 0.8 FTE that Liam was referring to then? That was in 2021. Okay, all right. So yeah. basically our total staff complement has not changed. No. No, okay. and, and in actuality as... Uh, Kristen was just saying, uh, we backfilled the manager of environment position internally, but we didn't backfill the, that position. That So um, the manager of environment position was filled from someone internal in the organization. We didn't backfill that position. Yeah, and, okay. And that was a point, that was a point six or point eight. Point eight. And point eight. And what we're asking for is a point eight point five to bring the HR up to a full position. So, so it's not from an FTE perspective, it's not an increase. No. 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 Okay. Yeah. And I guess the other thing that hinges on what, how many FTEs you need is service levels. And we've never really had a discussion about what service levels we expect. And that's, you know, things like, you know, turnaround time and how fast to do things and, or again, some other just general, you know, what level you're going to maintain the roads to and stuff like that. And that all comes out of the asset management plan part of it. But the other is, you know, 
is a bylaw officer expected to answer a call within three hours or planners supposed to turn around, uh, you know, look at initial re request within a week of receiving it, that kind of thing. We've never talked about those kind of service delivery levels. And those are those those are the ones that have big impacts on how many staff you need, too. So anyhow, I'm quite yeah. happy with the process the way it's uh, for yeah. this year, what's been. Yeah, and, I, and I think at some point, the it may be a, a, rec a suggestion at some point. I mean, the core services are identified uh, under policy and something to revisit that in terms of, of council land management might be appropriate at some point if, if that becomes an issue. But uh, yeah, I don't think that's really something for, for us here to deal with and to address. Um, is there any other further comments or anything? John? You're on mute, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one, if, if we were to spend 200,000, including benefits, et cetera, on a senior person to help with the uh, tendering, et cetera, that's about a 3% increase based on last year's tax budget of, uh, on uh, property taxes. And so that gives you some context, but that, that person may also be able to help building because there's a lot and a lot of building approvals and planning approvals, there's a lot of engineering work as well. Okay. And, and so that, you know, you may be able to spread it out to deal with the concerns of the load for uh, the planning department and the engineering department. But yes, I mean, obviously we're, we're at a high point now in terms of a tax increase, bringing on another 3% wouldn't be the greatest. But on the other hand, there, I think there might, there will be a payback in terms of the maybe getting better results of what is built and maybe fewer problems from what is uh, what is commissioned. Because I know from personal experience right now, you know, just management of all these these various things really, really is is far more time consuming because you know there's always issues coming up, supply chain and all this stuff, which you're um, always you, know, you need someone on top of all these people, you know, someone building a new bridge. Uh, there's a lot of thought to go into that and pros and cons, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. I think we've already mentioned um, we want to venture into uh, management responsibilities uh, overall. Appreciate your comments as thoughts. And, uh, but I don't think it's something that would come as recommended from the committee. It's something uh, that lies in the in, in others areas than what we have here as noted. Okay, before we wrap up, we're running uh, about 15 minutes over time. I just wanted to make sure that we picked up everybody's comments and thoughts. Anything further that we'd like to do as it relates to this point, because we'll zip through everything else. <laughs> To conclusion, pardon me. Do we need a recommendation for council, or is there another iteration? I, I, I'm not sure. Well, I think what we're we're suggesting is that um, there, there. I don't know what recommend is. Okay, I'll just ask the committee: Is there a recommendation that you would like to specifically make? We've provided a number of comments. Is, is it appropriate to say something along the lines that we've reviewed the um, thing and have no problems with it going forward for um, public, consultation? public consultation? Yeah, I think that's probably appropriate. Thank you, Councillor. At the Finance Advisory yeah, that's a, Any other comments or thoughts as it relates to that? At least to provide out some. Plus, we've, there's, there's comments provided as well, or I should say there are discussion points that might be appropriate to see. Be referenced. Um, are you proposing that motion, Allison? Yeah. You have a second. What did I propose, Deb? That the Finance Advisory Committee <laughs> review the draft budget materials at its March 3rd, 2023 meeting and support the process moving forward to public consultation. Oh, okay. John, second. Any other discussion or points? All in favor? Thank you. Okay. Oh, we got something. There we go. Um, now I'm going to move on. Point five, other business. I, is there anything that's identified? I don't know that, of anything. Okay, we'll move on. Information items are provided under section six. I don't think we have to refer to those specifically in our discussion at this point. Our next meeting is um, about to be, do you have a date or just? I think um, there's only one outlier 
Um, and so I'm going to ask her if Monday, March 13th at 12.30 a.m. will work. Who is the outlier? Well, Joyce. Um, I'm sorry to be assertive. We have a lot. We've got a lot of doodle poles in the air right now. Yeah. Yeah, I've sensed that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What do you think, Joyce? Can you... Uh... I can do the 13th. I just can't do after the, after the 14th. That's still the Perfect. 13th. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. Excellent. So, so let's go ahead and plan for it then at that time. Thank you. Sorry, what time was that? 1230. I'll send something right after this meeting. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything else before we move to an adjournment? Seeing none, I want to thank everybody for their contribution discussion today. Uh, I've certainly appreciated the um, quality of the presentation that was provided, and uh, I think uh, uh, that that's a very good uh, outcome in terms of what we'd hope to achieve at this time. So again, thank you, everybody, and I look forward to uh, our next meeting. Take care. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Bye.